That may be the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. All right, I need to get a couple trigger warnings out there. Okay, we are going to be talking about some very talented players. Yes, a lot of these wide receivers. I mean, if you were starting an NFL franchise today, I mean, these would be some of the top guys. I mean, these players are fantastic talents, but at the end of the day, we are not playing Madden. At the end of the day, we are not playing real life NFL general manager going, who's the more talented wide receiver? No, what we're trying to do is we are trying to identify the players that are placed into situations that have the talent profiles, which should combine to have them have a fantastic fantasy points output at the end of the season. So we see every single year, I mean, wide receivers that may not necessarily have the same level of talent drastically outscore those guys that are way more valuable in the football field. So please understand when we go through and we make these overvalued videos, I'm not going to be the typical person just coming out and saying, oh, bum wide receiver X is a little bit overvalued because at that point, of course, yeah, you're not going to ruffle any feathers, but you're not helping anybody either. I'm not trying to tell you to avoid a wide receiver being drafted in the 12th round because who does that help? I'm trying to tell you to avoid the landmine going in the fourth round right now and go with someone that has a higher hit rate. But of course, we're going to dive into the guys. I have a couple announcements. Guys, it's this week. June 19th, the Fantasy Flock Meetup. Very excited to announce it. June 19th, 6 p.m. at Zilker Park. Now, no, you don't have to be on Patreon. No, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is show up, look for me, look for my giant dog, and you'll find us. We can hang out. We can meet. This is going to happen before I go to Florida. So please, if you're in Texas, come out if you can. And also, drop a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out so much. Nobody is growing as fast as the Fantasy Flock Network, and that's because of all the support that y'all have showed as of late. But let's dive into it. Let's bring up one of those damn good wide receivers in Jamar Chase. And okay, so with Jamar Chase, no, we are not talking about him from a dynasty perspective because obviously Jamar Chase in dynasty, one of the top tier, one of the top caliber wide receivers that you're going to find to build your team around for the long term. But for a redraft standpoint, for 2021 production, Jamar Chase's price makes absolutely no sense right now. Now, before we get into why I think that it's a very bad price point to pay, let me, of course, address the fact that Jamar Chase is a fantastic wide receiver prospect. We have to give credit where credit's due. Jamar Chase coming into the NFL checks every single box. I mean, he has the speed. He ran a 4-3-4 at his pro day. He's 21 years old. You love to see the age coming into the NFL draft. You want the player to come out after their true junior season. He broke out a sophomore year, which we identified on our Dynasty Rookie Draft Guide, mattering so much for those wide receivers historically. He has the size 6 foot, 201 pounds, gets drafted in the top five of the NFL draft to his former collegiate quarterback. Now, I know that a lot of people want to focus in on those, but way more importantly, way more importantly, this is what matters while evaluating these wide receiver prospects coming into the NFL. You need to see the production. Jamar Chase crushed that mark. Now, if you look at his overall market numbers, they're a little bit skewed, but you have to understand. I mean, he did this in possibly the best collegiate offense that there has ever been. He did this in the 2019 offense with Justin Jefferson, Clyde Edwards-Alaire. We also know that Joe Brady was calling the shots alongside Joe Burrow. So, of course, there's a reason that this offense was so prolific. But you go back to that magical 2019 season, and I know a ton of people have talked about this, so we're going to briefly discuss it. But anyway, Jamar Chase, six receptions a game, 127 receiving yards a game, and 20 total touchdowns. Now, he did this his true sophomore year at 19 years old. Compared to Justin Jefferson, who was a year older at 20 years old, I mean, he outproduced him. Justin Jefferson got more targets, got more receptions. Jefferson averaged 7.4 receptions a game, yet only 102 receiving yards a game. That's over 25 less than Jamar Chase, and he had less overall touchdowns. So Jamar Chase, in the same exact situation, was more productive than Justin Jefferson in 2019 at LSU at a younger age. And obviously, we just saw Justin Jefferson put up one of the best, if not the best, rookie wide receiver season of all time. Now, Jamar Chase, this year, is being drafted as wide receiver 21. So I know a lot of people in redraft formats are going to say, Mason, you're wrong here. Jamar Chase is going to come in. He's going to crush right away. I mean, look at that prospect profile that you just covered. But I really want everybody to take a step back and understand that there is a difference between seeing a player hit at the NFL level compared to seeing them be a great wide receiver prospect. Because even with these great prospects, you still have guys coming into the NFL 
that may not necessarily start hot right away, may not necessarily ever pan out. I mean, another fantastic prospect in recent memory was a Corey Davis. Corey Davis checked every single box. Yes, he was coming out of a smaller school in Western Michigan. He also goes in the top five of that 2017 NFL draft class, and he starts off extremely slow. And I know that you have rookie wide receivers that break out every single season. You find a lot of league winners from drafting rookie wide receivers. But what I want to focus in on is the fact that we are not necessarily as good at predicting what rookie wide receivers are going to be league winners as we think. Because we go through, and if you look since 2014, so since you actually have this ADP data being tracked, and you track the top wide receiver going in redraft leagues that year and their fantasy finish from their rookie season, I mean, it ain't pretty. I'll tell you that. Yes, you can always go through. You can find the Justin Jefferson. You can go through. You can find an A.J. Brown, a D.K. Metcalf. Guys that broke out their rookie seasons, but they weren't being drafted as the top guy. They were being pushed down the board just slightly. Now, if we go through those past draft classes, last year, CeeDee Lamb, top player. And I understand CeeDee Lamb had a reason he didn't hit right away. I understand Dak Prescott going down kind of derailed his season, but we're looking at this through a macro sense. We're not just focusing in on that one situation. Now, 2019, Nikhil Harry. So Nikhil Harry, I mean, he didn't even have a placement in points per game at the wide receiver position. That's someone that couldn't even get on the field. And when he did, he couldn't even draw targets. Now, C.D. Lamb finished as the wide receiver 35 in points per game his rookie season, going back to that. Then D.J. Moore was that wide receiver in the 2018 class, going the highest in redraft leagues. Now, D.J. Moore, another fantastic wide receiver prospect from that 2018 NFL draft class. Now, he finishes as wide receiver 38 in points per game his rookie season. Now, Corey Davis, we previously talked about from that 2017 draft class, he finishes as wide receiver 81. Then from 2016, you have Corey Coleman was being drafted at top of the drafts that year, finishes as wide receiver 65. Then finally, a wide receiver prospect that we know is better than Jamar Chase. I mean, this wide receiver prospect, if you were playing Dynasty back then, even if you were a casual NFL fan back then, you pretty much know this. But Amari Cooper coming into the NFL draft was essentially if not the best wide receiver prospect that we have seen the past 20 years, right up there. And Amari Cooper was actually drafted as high as Jamar Chase is going this year. Now, this is the first player we've covered on this list that was going at this mark where Jamar Chase is being drafted as the wide receiver 21. But even Amari Cooper himself coming in his rookie season was the wide receiver 28 in points per game. So still lower than where Jamar Chase is being drafted by a considerable amount. Now, another wide receiver prospect. This is the reason we got these two guys behind us because there were such good prospects coming into the NFL and we fell in love with them in that NFL draft class in 2014 and 2015. But Sammy Watkins in that 2014 draft class was also being drafted as high as Amari Cooper, also being drafted as high as Jamar Chase in redraft leagues. Sammy Watkins finishes as the wide receiver 32 in points per game. So we go through and we look at this and we go, okay, yes. We can safely say that rookie wide receivers, you're going to have those busts every year. You're going to have those hits every year. While I think you do want to be targeting rookie wide receivers in drafts, understanding that they do have that upside to provide a ton of value on where they are being drafted. We simply never see wide receivers in redraft leagues going as high as Jamar Chase is going his rookie season. And also, historically, we've been really bad at identifying what wide receiver is actually going to be that rookie year breakout. So instead of going through and drafting Jamar Chase as your wide receiver too, what I would prefer to do is I'd rather, hey, wait till the end of the draft, go get an Elijah Moore, go get a Terrace Marshall, go get a Rashad Bateman, draft a couple of those guys, just have more darts you're throwing at the dartboard and hopefully hit on one of, the, one of them. But no, Jamar Chase at this price point makes no sense in my opinion. And I know he's the best wide receiver prospect in this class, but the price is so inflated because of what everybody saw from Justin Jefferson last year. But just because Jefferson did it, doesn't mean Jamar Chase is going to. Okay, so now let's go to our next guy. Someone that I have to admit, I have a negative bias towards him. We have to get that out of the way. Let's talk about Deontay Johnson here. Okay, so with Deontay Johnson, going as the wide receiver 19 right now in fantasy drafts, he's going ahead of a player like DJ Moore, which I simply don't understand. I mean, DJ Moore, God dang. I don't want to talk about him in this video, but let's focus in on Deontay Johnson. So let's look at what Deontay Johnson did last year, because I think we going back to 2019, it's going to be so hard to draw anything from that 2019. It was his rookie year. He was playing alongside Mason Rudolph. Juju Smith Schuster was hurt. Chase Claypool wasn't there. I mean, what are you going to draw from 2019 that has value? But in 2020, Deontay Johnson actually finishes the wide receiver 19 in points per game. And we have to be completely honest here. That's even more impressive considering that there were multiple games that he left early. I'm sure if you take out those games where he didn't see the full share of snaps, then actually with Deontay Johnson, 
probably would have been a little bit higher than wide receiver 19. So yes, you're getting him at a discount compared to his production last year. But I'm looking at Deontay Johnson. I'm going 2020 was the best case scenario for Deontay Johnson. Absolute best case scenario. There's no way he comes back to match that production because in 2020, he saw 9.6 targets a game. So Deontay Johnson almost had 10 targets a game last year. 10 targets. That's ridiculous for this offense. Now, he was very, very bad with these targets. That's the main thing I want to focus in on. So he almost sees 10 targets a game, yet he averages 61 receiving yards a game. That is nothing. Six yards per target is one of the worst marks in the NFL. I know a lot of people want to focus in on drops. I'd rather just focus in on this because we know that drops are a little bit volatile. They're a little bit hard to project year to year. But no, with Deontay Johnson, don't worry about the drops. Worry about the fact that he's just a bad wide receiver when he's getting targeted. And more so, what you have to worry about with Deontay Johnson is, yeah, I mean, he got the volume last year. But because he was so incredibly inefficient with that volume, because Deontay Johnson is playing in an offense that goes out, invest into Najee Harris, kind of indicating that they're probably going to be a little bit more run happy this year. They have Juju Smith Schuster, who's also 24 years old, just like Deontay Johnson. They're bringing him back. So those targets aren't going anywhere. Then Chase Claypool taking a leap into year two. Now I don't love Chase Claypool in fantasy drafts. I want to be the first person to say that, but you're looking at this as a situation we're going, okay, you got Juju, you have Claypool, you have Deontay Johnson, you have Najee Harris, you have a very bad offensive line, and you have just the corpse of Ben Roethlisberger. How is this going to play out? How is this going to play out where these guys return value? It's simply not. And I think what you would have to project is you'd have to project that they're probably going to be trying to get targets to the players that were more efficient with them. And I think that's going to be Juju Smith-Schuster and Chase Claypool, not Deontay Johnson. If you want to draft a wide receiver in Pittsburgh, I'm simply going to be drafting the cheapest out of the three options rather than going with the most expensive right now in Deontay Johnson. Okay, so now let's go down to the worst value out of this entire list. I mean, this is someone, if I draft 100 fantasy drafts, I'm not drafting them a single time. Let's talk about Debo Samuel here. Okay, so Debo Samuel currently going as wide receiver 34 in most redraft leagues. And he's going ahead of Curtis Samuel, going ahead of Brandon Cooks, somehow going ahead of LaVisca Chenault, and I just don't understand it. Now, I am not one to shy away from investing into this San Francisco 49ers offense. I mean, Trey Lance may be one of my favorite quarterback values of all fantasy leagues right now. But regardless, I mean, you're diving into Debo Samuel here and you're going, okay, he's being drafted as the wide receiver 34. And in 2020, he was the wide receiver 43 in points per game. Very similar though to Deontay Johnson. You're looking at Debo Samuel you're going, okay, you left some games early. You take those out. 2020, very hard to draw a lot from it just because it was already such a small sample with the time missed to begin with. So we can't look too much into that. But 2019, a full slate of season, here you have Debo Samuel, wide receiver 41. And I know a lot of people want to point to the fact that it was Debo Samuel's rookie year, which is fair to say, but it's not like he's a Terrace Marshall rookie. It, it's not like he was a Curtis Samuel rookie coming into the NFL at 20 years old going, okay, this is a player that's most likely going to need to develop some. No, Debo Samuel was drafted at 23. This is someone, if you're drafted at 23, I mean, that's a year younger than Juju Smith-Schuster is right now. That's something you come in, you're already developed. That's why you're getting drafted. You're getting drafted to be a day one player. So I don't want to use that too much as an excuse for Debo Samuel. Of course, we have to acknowledge it. But wide receiver 41 then. And the problem with Debo is they bring in Ayuk. They have George Kittle. They have the top two options on this team. Now, I love Trey Lance for fantasy. We've already discussed this. But with Trey Lance, the reason we love him in fantasy is not because you expect this to be one of the highest passing volume offenses in the NFL supporting all these weapons. No, the reason you love Trey Lance in fantasy is because you're hoping he's going to be a Lamar Jackson. You're hoping he's going to be a Jalen Hurt, someone picking up 60 rushing yards a game. And I know that maybe seem a little bit aggressive, but even if he's picking up 40 rushing yards a game, even if he's picking up a rushing touchdown every other game, he's going to be soaking up so much of the value from this offense. I don't think that the passing volume is going to be there. And if you're going to be investing into a third option on a team, don't you want to be chasing someone with a ton of upside? Don't you want to be chasing someone in an offense like the Kansas City Chiefs? And lastly, don't you want to be chasing someone that's able to stay healthy? Now, you all know I am the last person to call a player injury prone. I think that in fantasy, 
the term injury prone gets thrown out there way too much. I think injuries, if you look over a large sample, the majority of them are random. And I think most of the time, if you can see consecutive injuries, like you see a shoulder sprain, then you see a tear ACL. And all of a sudden someone misses a majority of the time over the course of the two seasons. The two injuries are just completely two different sides of the body. I want to say that's random. I want to say that we can't project that going forward. But that's not the case here with Debo Samuel. I mean, Debo Samuel, I'm willing to say he's injury prone. And we have seen this before. You go through his history back in 2015 and 2016 and 2017. So all in college, I mean, here in 2015, he suffers a hamstring strain, which keeps him out seven games. That's a decent amount of time. 2016, hey, another hamstring strain keeps him out three games. Then in 2017, a fibula fracture. Then in 2019, a groin strain. 2020, a foot fracture. Also a hamstring strain. Also, another hamstring strain later in the year. So it's completely different than a player that we talked about that got mislabeled as an injury-prone player in fantasy a few years ago in Keenan Allen, where you're going, okay, this is a guy with a shoulder sprain, then he has a torn ACL, then he has a lacerated spleen. Obviously, none of this is connected. Obviously, this isn't something you have to worry about. But here we are counting four separate hamstring strains for Debo Samuel that kept him out a total of 16 games since 2015. Also, throwing in some other miscellaneous injuries, this is the picture perfect of injury prone. So I simply don't get it. I, I don't know why he is being drafted higher than he's ever finished in fantasy. If we have seen the situation change for the worse for Debo Samuel, and he's continued to prove it, that he's an injury prone type player. So Debo, someone I probably won't be drafting in a single league. Now our next guy, going to be getting a ton of hate for this one. Let's go Terry McLaurin. Okay, now. Every time you say something bad about Terry McLaurin, I don't know what it is about the fantasy community. I don't know if it's just because he was that sleeper that hit back in 2019, but with McLaurin, right now he's being drafted as the wide receiver 10 in redraft leagues. Now, this is ahead of Keenan Allen, Michael Thomas, Allen Robinson. Why? Why? Are you just wanting to project the next breakout? Why are we seeing Terry McLaurin go ahead of wide receivers that you've seen the top tier elite production from in fantasy this isn't the running back position you don't have to be constantly trying to identify the new guy what you want to be doing is you want to be going through and getting the stable guy that you know is going to produce a guy like a keenan allen where you have seen him consistently be a low to high end wide receiver one in fantasy for years now and a situation gets better and you go okay Keenan Allen is a wide receiver one in fantasy season after season after season then he gets an upgrade at quarterback of course, Keenan Allen's the draft pick. Why are we drafting Terry McLaurin here? I mean, if we go through this Terry McLaurin profile, his rookie year, very similar to Debo Samuel. I know it's his rookie year. I understand that. Yes, you cut him some slack. You want to project him to develop beyond that. But he's a 23-year-old rookie. So don't be thinking this is a Juju Smith-Schuster type situation. I mean, here, he was the wide receiver 29 his rookie year. And I know a lot of people, if you just chase the narrative, they'd make you think that he was the wide receiver too. I mean, they would make you think that he was some elite producer back then because of his PFF grades. But anyway, he averaged six and a half targets a game, 65 receiving yards a game. He had seven total touchdowns. Now, I know it's great to see a rookie get that production. It's great to see a rookie get that much volume. But hey, you want to know why he got that much volume? Hey, let me fill you in on a little secret here. You want to know the former Washington Redskins competition for targets here for Terry McLaurin? You have Chris Thompson at the number one spot with targets after Terry McLaurin with 58. Then you have Steven Sims after that. Trey Quinn, do y'all remember the Trey Quinn name? Oh my God, Trey Quinn's sleeper in fantasy. Then you had Kelvin Harmon. Like, there was nobody. There was no, I'm pretty sure I could have walked over to Washington. I've been like, hey, um, I heard y'all need someone to run routes during practice. Do you want a 153-pound guy that literally can't get hit or you're going to send him to the hospital to run some routes to help your cornerbacks? They've probably been like, oh yes, thank God. Thank, thank God, we, we need someone. We have Chris Thompson getting the second most targets on this team. Now in 2020, you would go, okay, um, Terry McLaurin, this is the year of the breakout. This is the year where you see the DK Metcalf. You see the AJ Brown take that next leap. Terry McLaurin, also no competition for targets here. What does he do? He's the wide receiver 21 in fantasy in points per game. He averages nine targets a game. You can't really expect that to go any higher. 74 receiving yards a game. He has four total touchdowns. Now, same situation here. I mean, JD McKissick leading this team in targets, followed by Logan Thomas. Logan Thomas. Someone that literally hadn't been talked about for years then. Then you have Cam Sims third. This is a team that had no competition at all. And then all of a sudden in 2021, you bring in Curtis Samuel. 
you bring in Diami Brown. And these were investments. These aren't just guys that are being brought in for depth. I mean, they give Curtis Samuel $23 million guaranteed. I mean, that's just guaranteed money. That's not even the entire contract. They take Diami Brown in the middle of the third round. And I know they get an upgrade at quarterback. Fitzmagic is going to be the best quarterback that you have ever seen Terry McLaurin play with, which is why I agree. I think that Terry McLaurin should probably be drafted higher than he finished in fantasy last year. Terry McLaurin should be drafted higher than wide receiver 21, but he shouldn't be wide receiver 10. He shouldn't be going ahead of Keenan Allen, Michael Thomas, Allen Robinson. That literally just makes no sense at all. I can never get behind that draft pick. So Terry McLaurin, probably another player I'm never going to be drafting if you have Keenan Allen available on the board. Now, thank you, my dudes. I really hope that this helped y'all out at all. Of course, if it did, go down there, drop a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out a ton. And I'll see y'all with the video tomorrow. I want to thank everybody who has recently decided to join the flock in Alex, Jack, Bud, Kevin, Connor, Caesar, Jonathan, Joseph, Jordan, and James. Thank you, my dudes.